This is Carlos Ferreira, and I'm giving here an introduction to the hybridized flux reconstruction schemes, which is part of my work as a PhD student with the supervision of Dr. Brian Vermeer at the Computational Aerodynamics Lab in Concordia University. Flux reconstruction methods are a family of higher accurate schemes, and they can recover other existing formulations, such as the discontinuous Galerkin and spectral difference methods with the use of correction functions. And in particular, we consider here the methods of Vincent et al, where the correction functions are written in terms of Legendre polynomials and a parameter C. Generally, flux reconstruction methods are used with explicit time stepping due to their conveniency in terms of implementation, as well as the computational cost. But we know that these explicit methods can require prohibitively small time step sizes to maintain stability. So in applications where we have high numerical stiffness, implicit methods are preferred. The issue is that in an implicit method, we need to solve a system which generally requires linearization. And the computational cost of solving these problems is very large. And in fact, um, they're proportional to p plus 1, which is the order of accuracy of the method, uh, to the power of 2 times d, where d is the dimension of the problem. So for real scale problems, the cost of solving these systems can be just prohibitively expensive. Making use of existing finite element method approaches and theory of domain decomposition, a hybridization procedure was ported to the higher or discontinuous Galerkin method with the goal of reducing the cost of computing these implicit systems. And I'll go a bit into more detail um, as to what this entails, but basically we transform the global problem, such as the one that we see on the left, into a set of local problems with their let boundary data. I'll discuss uh, the suitability of this hybridization approach for flux reconstruction schemes in the context of advection problems. The goal of this small talk is to give an introduction to these methods, but please refer to the article in question for more mathematical and specific implementation details. I'll briefly discuss here, in sort of a visual approach, what the hybridized effort method looks like, followed by a spectral analysis to evaluate the behavior of the numerical error and the re its relation to conventional FR. Then I'll discuss some results from a few linear and nonlinear numerical examples. I'll now describe the steps to implement the hybridized form of the flux reconstruction approach. Similar to the implementation of most higher methods, um, we're going to map our PDE to a reference space. So specifically, we map each element to a standard space with the use of shape functions and an associated um, geometric Jacobians. This is done for the sake of efficiency. And some of the notation that will be used here involves omega k for elements and f bar for the faces in the global computational domain, such as the red line that we observe in the left diagram. The next step is to place a set of solution points as we observe on the left um, element in this slide. These points are used to hold values of the solution and fluxes within each element. These points interpolate polynomials of degree p with the use of basis functions, and they are discontinuous at the interfaces. So this is common to the FR implementation. In order to hybridize the method, we need to add, in addition to these solution points, another set of points that are globally placed on the faces of the computational domain, such as the squares that we see here on the right um, side of the slide. The points here hold values of a new unknown that we call u hat, and they interpolate polynomials of a lower dimension on each of the faces of the computational domain. So we have in this slide a view of what those trace polynomials could look like for two adjacent elements. The next step can be directly taken from the conventional effort method where we add a correction to the discontinuous flux that we just computed using the solution points. This consists of uh, correction functions that are used to lift information from the boundaries to the interior of that element. And they increase the degree of the flux polynomial to p plus one 
so that its divergence following the same polynomial space of the solution. On the right, we have an example of what they look like in a one-dimensional problem, which can be used to generate tensor product formulations. The specifics on how to construct them can be found in the reference shown in slide two. We see that uh, uh, as part of this correction term, there's the normal flux jump, which contains the Riemann solver. And um, this Riemann solver needs to be redefined. So for a conventional effort method, a Riemann solver generally takes values from the left and from the right of each interface. And usually these are just interpolated solution values from each of the adjacent elements. And uh, this Riemann solver is always chosen to be strongly conservative and consistent at each point. Then the solution points from the left element are all connected to the solution points of the right element. And this directly translates into the linear system that we usually solve for um, FR methods. Now, for the hybridized approach, which we see on the right, the Riemann solver is reconsidered in a way that the direct connection between solution points of adjacent elements is not direct anymore. Instead, the only communication from one element to another can be through that new unknown that we have added. By doing that, we cannot guarantee conservation of the method unless we enforce it via a conservation statement. So from here we see that in the first equation, we have a set as the sum of a set of local problems. And in the second equation, a global statement that is the so-called transmission condition. Now, it seems that we have ended up with um, a larger problem. And in fact, we have. But the goal here is to rewrite the problem only in terms of the trace unknown. The set of equations for the HFR method can be translated to matrix form, such as the ABCD system that we observe here, or with a linearized form in the case of nonlinear problems. Then we can find the shared complement of A in this matrix and arrive at the global system that we actually have to solve, with, which is highlighted in blue. And it's L times U hat equals Q, where the computation of the left-hand side matrix and the right-hand side vectors are shown below. An important feature to know is that because we have decoupled the direct relation between the internal degrees of freedom of adjacent elements, the A block um, is also block diagonal and it can be inverted efficiently. In fact, we don't need to generate the ABCD global blocks, but instead we can generate these matrices at the elemental levels and use some sort of su surjective mappings um, to assemble the global system. The equations for these blocks in FR are given on the right for a linearized problem. So it turns out that we can choose different spaces for the basis functions that we use for the trace variable, and this will influence the size of the linear system. On the left, we have discontinuous trace polynomials, and on the right, we have continuous trace polynomials. These lead respectively to what we call the HFR and EFR methods in line with existing teaching naming conventions. Here we can see the benefits of hybridization for two-dimensional problems with quadrilateral elements. Consider, for example, a solution polynomial degree 3, which leads to a fourth order scheme. In conventional FR, we would expect to have about 16 degrees of freedom per mesh point, whereas half of that would be expected with HFR, and a third of that would be expected with EFR. In addition, this would translate into a problem with 512 non-zero entries in the global operator for FR, as opposed to 225 for HFR and over 110 for EFR methods. While the effect on performance is expected to improve with HFR and EFR methods, we will check using a spectral analysis the numerical error that's associated with these methods. So in the spectral analysis, what we do is we consider the wave propagation behavior of a numerical method by considering the linear abduction equation in a periodic domain. After application of the hybridization approach to that linear abduction equation, we obtain the ABCD system that we see here on the left of the slide, and then we can manipulate it to rewrite it fully in terms of the interior solution. Doing this uh, reveals a block circulant M matrix, which tells us about the coupling between the elements that, that's caused uh, by the hybridization procedure. 
So it turns out that um, hybridized methods for linear detection with this continuous polynomial in an upward Riemann solver lead to the exact same behavior of AFR methods, conventional AFR methods. And this is not the case for EFR, which, as we see from the right image, has a tighter coupling with elements that share a node with it. So we place attention to the F EFR method, specifically with this spectral analysis, which can reduce the computational cost even further. We perform the analysis um, uh, for a set of correction functions and highlight common ones, such as the DG for discontinuous galerking uh, with a continuous line, SD for a spectral difference with a dashed line, and Wins type method with a dashed dotted line, which is, is the scheme that's proposed in the initial paper of the EFR method. In these plots, we see the dissipation associated with a range of wave numbers, where more negative values mean additional dissipation. Each of these plots was generated for polynomials of degree 1 up to 4. The general observation is consistent with conventional effort methods, where increasing the value of C has uh, a, an effect uh, that, that increases dissipation of the method at the larger scales and the opposite behavior at the smaller scales. EFR methods have a similar behavior in the range of resolved wave numbers that tend to have slightly more dissipation in general, and this difference becomes smaller for the higher polynomial degrees. To validate our spectral and performance analysis, we perform a set of numerical examples involving linear detection and um, the Euler equations. Specifically, we have the isentropic vortex problem and an airfoil vortex interaction problem. So for a linear detection problem, we quickly analyze the numerical error considering a slice of the solution after, uh, which is a Gaussian profile that has a vector for 20 cycles over a domain. And we use fourth order accurate uh, semi-discretization for this method. The results here show, are shown for different correction functions and DG in a continuous line, SD in a dashed line, and Wins correction function in a dashed dotted line. So for both HFR and EFR method, the DG correction function shows the closest proximity to the exact solution of the problem, followed by SD and then Wins scheme. In the case of EFR, there's additional behavior, but the behavior among the correction functions is maintained. Next, we consider the isentropic vortex, which consists of an initial vortex that adects through the computational domain for one cycle. On the right-hand side, we plot the L2 norm of the error against the square root of the number of elements considered. And we observe that the convergence is to the right order of accuracy, which is expected to be P plus 1. And this occurs more specifically as we refine the mesh. An interesting result that we can observe from this numerical experiment is the, some sort of a density view of these global operators for one of the great refinement levels of the isentropic vortex problem. And again, we consider a P3 scheme, which is fourth order. We consider from left to right um, the conventional effort method followed by HFR and then EFR method, where we observe a reduction of three in the total number of non-zero entries when we use EFR methods. And for an instructor grid, this difference would be larger as the number of non-zeros in FR figure on the left, it would increase. So in terms of performance, we analyze the effect of the correction parameter. On the left, we have plots of the L2 norm of the error against the wall clock time for one of the grid levels. We identify relevant correction functions with a triangle for DG, a square for SD, and a circle for Wins method. In all cases, the DG correction function is, against the most, is again the most accurate, but uh, also the one that takes the most computational effort. To further analyze the cause of this, we can see the number of linear solves and GM rest iterations against the C parameter, showing that with increasing value of C, the number of linear, linear solves required for the iterative solver to converge decreases. So we see that there's a trade-off between the computational time and the accuracy for modifying the C parameter. Finally, we have a problem involving the interaction between a vortex in a NACA 0012 airfoil. For this problem, we consider a vortex that's placed five cords upstream from a NACA 0012 airfoil. We consider a mesh that's composed of about 6,800 quadrilateral elements 
and we collect statistics once during the interaction. The parameters for the vortex, such as the radius and the strength, were chosen as shown here in the slide. So here's a snapshot of the pressure during the onset of the interaction. Also here's at the beginning and uh, now with the onset of the interaction. So we collected some quantities, including pressure readings at different simulation times, and compared them against the run with a finer mesh in a regular effort scheme. We compare results with FR in red, HFR in blue, and EFR in yellow. For a polynomial degree of one, pressure readings indicate additional numerical error for EFR compared to HFR and FR, which do not show a relative significant difference. However, we observe that in terms of performance, EFR is already 1.7 times faster than conventional effort methods. In the case of HFR, the additional operations of hybridization counteract the effects of this polynomial degree, which end up in, uh, with a slower simulation. Results follow a similar train with increasing polynomial, and we choose to show in this talk only results for P1 and P4, but a performance gain of 4.3 for HFR and 6.7 times is observed with the EFR method. Then the performance result summary for all polynomial degree and correction functions considered is shown here in this figure. These results are consistent with the spectral analysis and the performance analysis, where the DG correction function is more computationally expensive for implicit methods, and that hybridization provides an excellent approach to reducing the computational cost of these simulations. So we have introduced a hybridized formulation of effort schemes we have shown that HFR methods are identical to FR methods for linear advection. EFR methods uh, were shown to, to introduce additional numerical error, particularly at lower order, with closer behavior to HFR and FR as the polynomial degree increases. Simulation of an airfoil vortex problem showed speed ups of up to 6.7 times faster for the airfoil vortex interaction problem. So HFR and EFR are suitable choices for hybridization of the EFR approach. For further information on our research, you may visit the website for the Computational Aerodynamics Lab at Concordia University.